Well, hello there, my friends. Chris Marcus here with you for Arcata Economics. Late on a Thursday night, yet because the silver market never sleeps, at least until the next spoof hits, we'll be here covering things. And fortunately, joined by John Adams of Adams Economics, who is going to check in with the Australian perspective of silver. Do have a lot of Australian fans out in the Arcata Economics audience. So, John, Pleasure to have you here tonight. How's everything going? Everything is going great, Chris. Uh, like a, I'm a big fan of your work, so uh, fantastic to uh, be on your channel for the first time. Well, I sure appreciate that, and nice to have you here. And can you give folks maybe who might be seeing you for the first time a little bit about your background and what you've been doing in Australia? I, <laughs> I hear you've been watching too many silver videos, and you go down the rabbit hole and. Um, but why, why don't you share a little bit about the background there? Sure, sure. Yeah. So, um, so I mean, basically, professional economist, studied economics here in Australia, um, uh, had a very interesting career. So worked as a bureaucrat, uh, both for the federal government as well as for one of the uh, state governments um, here in New South Wales, uh, which is uh, the Australia's largest state. Um, have worked in the private sector, so worked for Ernst & Young, big, big uh, for accounting firm as a management consultant, so uh, done a lot of management consulting work. Um, uh, and, and I had a chance to work um, in the federal parliament, so I was an economic advisor to a federal senator. Um, his name's Arthur Sinodinus, he's now the Australia's ambassador to Washington DC, uh, funny enough, but in 2012-13, uh, he was looking for an economist to help him on a whole host of um, economic matters, particularly around deregulation. Um, and uh, given that I've um, had a long, interesting career in um, in politics as well as economics, uh, I was uh, the man for the job and uh, spent 18 years at Parliament uh, working away on um, national economic issues. So that was really interesting and it was a fantastic experience. So in the last couple of years, uh, I've decided to sort of do the thing you're doing. Um, I mean, uh, what really got me motivated back in 2015-16 uh, was more about uh, the household debt bubble that Australia has. So we've got the second level, highest level of household de debt relative to GDP behind Switzerland. Um, thank you very much. Um, now, we, in the, in the course of um, Australian history, the debt bubble we have today is the biggest on record. And even if you compare our household debt bubble to the United States before the GFC, I know you like to talk about the big short. Your debt bubble back in uh, 05, 06 is nothing compared to what we have. I mean, we, we smash you in terms of the, our debt bubble. So um, so it is definitely quite scary. John, you better be <laughs> careful. You don't know if Janet Yellen's listening and gets jealous about a statement like that. So, I mean, it's, it's, the game's not over yet. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, the thing is, look, if Americans are going to leverage back up, uh, you know, that could be an, an interesting domestic story for you guys. Um, but, uh, but yeah, no, look, I was, I was pretty concerned about this household debt bubble when I was working at Parliament in 2012-13. And by 2015-16, I'm looking around the Australian media and uh, professional economists, bank economists, etc. I'm thinking, well, who's actually warning the public that something's wrong with, with this uh, debt bubble? And I found that there was no one. So I decided to um, start writing a number of uh, columns for um, Sydney's largest newspaper, The Daily Telegraph. And I wrote a, a whole host of opinion columns about economics and politics and talked about the debt bubble. And we've got a problem not just with household debt, but with, with foreign debt as well. So um, I brought some attention to that. Then uh, for, for another major online platform in Australia, uh, news.com.au in 2017-18, I did a, a series of, of articles about economic Armageddon. And, and that's basically based on a premise of um, Australia has the biggest debt bubble in our history. At the same time, we've got the biggest debt bubble in the history of the world. And if you look through economic history, you cannot find an empirical case study in which a debt bubble of this magnitude does not result in some sort of catastrophic economic event. And so uh, in, in, in one of the pieces in 2018, I basically laid out uh, six uh, uh, scenarios, three of them of a deflationary nature, three of them of an inflationary nature, um, and one of them is a stagflation. And that's where I think we're headed now. And really, I've just been on a journey to help um, educate the public uh, about our economic conditions. Uh, now, starting in 2017, uh, that's when I started to look uh, quite seriously about the precious metal market, started buying some silver myself, um, and, and, and I got much more interested in the silver story. And so um, starting in uh, 
July 2018, so so just uh, uh, you know uh, two and three quarter years, um, uh, beyond uh, doing my own uh, body of work on my own website, Adams Economics, and um, I also do a YouTube channel with my co-host Martin North. It's called In the Interest of the People. I actually work for um, South Australia's largest bullion dealer, so I'm their chief economist. The company is called As Good as Gold Australia, and so I do uh, I write a, a whole host of articles about the economy and gold and silver and um, uh, we do seminars, we do a whole bunch of YouTube interviews as well. And uh, so, yeah, so uh, for the last uh, coming on three years, I've been uh, engaging with um, both domestic and interna- both domestic and international clients who are looking for gold and silver and who want to actually understand this uh, story, uh, the story of uh, why people should be getting into the metals. And, um, and, and so, yeah, so it's, it's obviously a, a story about risk. It's a, it's a story about insurance. But uh, obviously, more increasingly, it's a story about corruption. And um, uh, before I met, you, uh, before we uh, talked on the phone, Chris, uh, the, for the first time, and before I saw your body of work, um, I started to um, pick up on uh, a few of the other sort of people in the industry in, in North America: um, Ted Butler, Bill Murphy, uh, 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 Rob Kirby, uh, Big Swear. So I started to come across, come across these people, and they were obviously saying something was wrong in the silver market. And uh, that's when I started to become educated in terms of, well, what is the real story around this market? And uh, then obviously you've come along <coughs> with your book, uh, <coughs> excuse me, and, 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 and the book is, I think, fantastic. Um, and, and obviously one of the, you know, the, the, the crown jewel of the book is the interview with Bart Shilton, which I've listened to. Um, and he obviously says that there was um, manipulation and for political reasons, they couldn't do anything uh, about it back in uh, 2010, 11. And, uh, and, and, and yeah, so, so, so anyone who thinks that uh, you're engaged in a conspiracy theory or I'm engaged in a conspiracy theory, um, you know, th- th- there's clearly, uh, they don't really understand what's going on. So um, in the Australian market, <clears throat> there's only one bully dealership, which openly talks about manipulation. And that's the one I work for. Um, so, <clears throat> I mean, from, from the ownership down, we do believe that silver is a manipulated market. Um, uh, and we obviously be uh, we try to be as honest with our clients as possible in terms of well what is what is the nature of so we, we can talk about the history of the um, of, of the golden like the history of gold and silver the history of hyperinflation the history of central banks we, we can talk about all of that but then obviously for investors it comes down to well, what's happening with the price and so um, uh, what I've tried to do since coming on board in 2018 is to um, write a series of articles and give a series of presentations where I try to, you know, um, you know, try to give an honest assessment about what is happening in the silver market. And obviously your body of work and your book and your interviews is a vital piece of um, information and evidence, not just for uh, Americans, but for people around the world who want to understand what's happening with this price because the price is set in New York and obviously it's regulated by American regulators and uh, the world is looking at it. They, they say, come on, John, let's, let's not accuse the CFTC of regulating the markets. Be fair, please. Fair enough. Fair enough. But, uh, but no, they you know, hurt their rep. <laughs> sure. Um, but, but, but yeah, no, look what, what I've noticed, and, and I'm not sure if you can speak about the American market, but I would honestly say that about, uh, look, sorry, look, uh, I just noticed the screen change. I was just going to say, Chris, that I, I can honestly say about 99% of the, the of the Australians who I deal with in our retail market have no real understanding of how the price is set um, and, and, and obviously where the corruption in the in the market is going. And so uh, so to, to the extent that I can in the Australian context, I've been trying to ex- uh, you know, trying to write articles and sort of explain at a technical level what's got really going on. But I know that a lot of Australians who are, interested in the silver market are uh, watching your channel are watching other channels in in the united states in canada uh, as well as in london and obviously trying to uh, you know become as educated as they can about what is the real nature of the silver market and how can they take advantage yeah well hopefully one of them will figure it out soon and let me know interesting chart here it looks like right around 10 o'clock the price is after 10 o'clock, silver is worth $26, apparently. So go figure that one. Although, John, what I would love to dig into is this Perth Mint. What's really happening there? Um, I'll start with a message I got from a reader today. 
He says, we have been notified by the Perth Mint. He, this is someone who had placed in the UK. And we've been notified by the Perth Mint that they are having trouble sourcing silver. Hence, some product lines are delayed at the moment, which includes the 10-ounce silver Kokobura. Um, what are you hearing about the Perth Mint and their silver stash these days? Well, um, so, so probably two important elements to the story about the Perth Mint, Chris, is so the first one is, let, let me just take the audience back to April of 2020, uh, when there was an article by Bloomberg talking about how the Perth Mint was, was flying over tons of gold to support the April contract. Now, um, what, I can, what I know for a fact is that uh, you know, retail customers, but also uh, retail approved accredited distributors for the Perth Mint were to being basically told it's going to take eight to 12 weeks to, to get your gold orders uh, delivered. Um, and so, so people like us had to wait, whereas the Perth Mint was sending all this gold over to the, the COMEX. And I've been sort of scratching my head thinking, well, why, why would they deny the Australian market gold and, and help New York? Now, uh, I had a really interesting uh, conversation today with someone who uh, has intimate knowledge of some of this stuff. And basically, the premiums that were happening in April of 2020 uh, were so extraordinary that, uh, you know, a whole host of people around the world just couldn't resist uh, not uh, supporting uh, the COMEX because the, the, they, they would be making more money in the wholesale market sending gold bars to New York compared to selling uh, gold in the retail market. Now, when we come into the silver conversation, uh, so a couple of points. The first thing is, is that when uh, probably in the last uh, maybe week, week and a half of February, uh, I have a, a local friend uh, in Perth uh, who physically went to the Perth Mint and uh, she was looking to buy some silver. And uh, she basically was told there is no silver for sale um, for retail clients who literally walked into their premises. Um, and that was a, a very sort of interesting sort of phenomena that, that happened there. Now, starting from the 1st of March, which was, I think, last week, uh, what we have heard is, is that even for uh, approved distributors for the Perth Mint, there is no silver to be had. Um, and uh, it doesn't matter the size of the order, whether it's $1,000 or $10 million, there is no silver. Um, and basically, we've been told and consistent with the email that you received, there is a delay in terms of silver. Now, uh, me and some of the people in the Australian market are scratching heads thinking, well, what's really going on? And so uh, two possible situations here. The first one is, is that uh, it would appear that the Perth Mint has some sourcing issues. So there were a number of uh, supply chains that the Perth Mint uh, relied on. And, the, and some of those supply chains are no longer uh, uh, supplying the Perth Mint uh, for, for a series of commercial reasons. I'm not sure. I don't have the full story on that, but uh, basically their typical suppliers are now supplying other uh, elements of the market. And so now the Perth Mint is sort of looking uh, across the world to see where can they source raw silver in adequate quantities. And that is obviously resulting in a delay in ability to supply the market with relevant product. So, so that's part one, uh, which I've been told about. Now, the other part, which is more speculation, is, is that um, obviously just like how the Perth Mint supported the COMEX contract in April of last year, there has been some speculation as to, to, to what extent will the Australian market support the COMEX in, in, in delivering um, silver for the March contract that we have underway. And so uh, there's been nothing confirmed in the press and uh, we're not sure if uh, any uh, shipments or flights from Australia to New York is actually happening at the moment to help um, the bullion banks uh, deliver almost 50 million ounces of silver to date uh, for the March contract. But uh, there, there could be something to that. But, uh, but the main sort of reason that I've been told is there's an issue in the supply chain and they're trying to resolve it. And uh, it's a little bit unclear as probably to- co Probably due to COVID, right? <laughs> uh, well, the, the- It's roaring out of control around the globe. You never know when it's gonna stop people years later from delivering gold. So that might be it. Well, so, so, so the thing is that, so, so they're not playing the COVID card now. Um, so, um, so yeah, so um, we will have to wait and see 
what happens in terms of the Perth Mint, but, uh, but, but there's obviously a, a whole host of wholesale and retail customers across the world sort of waiting for their deliveries and, and wanting Perth Mint product, but uh, it looks like they'll have to wait a little bit longer. So John, it makes sense, although what maybe doesn't make as much sense to me, does it seem strange that the COMEX in New York, supposedly the financial capital of the world, why do they need to be supported by the Perth Mint in Australia? Well, well, so here's the thing. So in the context of April, the April gold contract last year, so um, the refiners, particularly in Northern uh, America and Europe in particular in, in terms of Switzerland, they had shut down. And, and so basically they were struggling to get enough gold to make deliveries. Now, you would think that given the, um, uh, the, 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 the reporting that the COMEX does about how much gold is, is available for in terms of, uh, in terms of what is registered, what is eligible, you think they already have the gold in the vaults, but, uh, but no, they, they didn't have enough and they were basically needing um, gold to be delivered. So, so that's what happened uh, in terms of April. So, you know, I, I, mean, I mean, to be honest, March, like uh, in terms of this month, I am looking at this COMEX data on a day-by-day -day basis. And so we know that uh, up until 24 hours ago, about 49.8 million ounces to date in the first 10 or 11 trading days of the, of the contract have still for delivery. And I'm looking at this warehouse uh, data on a day-by-day -day basis, and I'm trying to figure out, well, if there is 50 million ounces that are going to be delivered, well, where's it coming from? And um, so, yeah, so, so far we probably have had about, um, well, we've had about 8 million ounces leave uh, the registered category. We've had about 4 million ounces leave the um, eligible category. So in total, um, we've got about, uh, about almost about 12.4 ounces. Oh, sorry, 12.4 million ounces. So um, I'm hoping by the end of March, we're going to see something closer to 50 million ounces leave the, so leave either registered or eligible. But, uh, but yeah, the, I mean, some of the industry experts who I've been talking to have said that the, um, that the bullion banks and those who are short have the month to deliver. And so, um, so, 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 so that is what I'm waiting to see. Now, it is interesting when you look at the silver price, Chris, is um, I think what happened in July last year was completely fascinating to my mind because on that occasion, you had the biggest delivery month in the history of the market, which ended up being, I think, about 86 million ounces. And the first two weeks of the month, the price did nothing. So it was around uh, $18 an ounce, $17.95 an ounce US. And then from mid-July to the end of the first week of August, the price ran 60%. So it went from $17.95 all the way up to $29 an ounce. Um, and obviously, why did it run? It's because they didn't have enough silver to meet all these deliveries and they needed to attract additional supply. And that's why the powers that be allow the price to run. So uh, obviously, a lot of people are comparing silver to palladium. Uh, you know, so we haven't reached that you know, cracking point of, of the COMEX or COMEX silver going up 400%. But 60% uh, of three weeks was an interesting phenomenon. And uh, I'm just wondering whether in the last fortnight of March, or, or it could well be that we get into the main contract, that we start to see, um, you know, uh, people who can't deliver enough silver, you know, in terms of these prices. I mean, like, it, it, it is... Um, you know, quite fascinating that, that you, you hear a number of voices across the industry um, who basically say there's, there's plenty of silver to be had, but that silver will only be delivered at higher prices. So um, it's, it's clear when I listen to your channel and to other channels that, you know, right across the physical supply chain, whether, whether it's the retail level, the wholesale level, the ETFs in terms of the SLV changing their prospectus or the bank leasing rates and, uh, you know, your conversation with, with David Jensen in terms of uh, what's happening in the London market, we're seeing the physical market being completely stretched at the current price. Um, and the question is, well, can COMEX at the current price deliver 50 million ounces plus? Uh, if they can't, we should see the price run in the next fortnight. Uh, if they somehow can, um, dare I say, I think the pressure will continue to build in the physical market and we could see some fireworks in the May contract. Yeah, we'll go figure if we actually had supply and demand function in silver market. I know that would be uh, <laughs> quite shocking. Although, John, a question I had for you, you mentioned in an email that uh, a few of the silver folks were discussing that someone had told you that they're not concerned about silver running out because Australia's just got a huge massive supply and if anything's needed on the COMEX they just have piles lying around 
I was curious, have you heard anything from that same guy since then? Because it's like he said that a couple of weeks ago and now here we have issues and I'm curious if there, uh, if you ever heard any, I'm curious what he would have said now. So, so, so yeah, so, um, uh, well, uh, probably a couple of points there. So, uh, yes, uh, in terms of the, the email group chain that we had a couple of weeks ago, uh, th th there's definitely has been some speculation as to how much surplus silver uh, Australia has, because one of the things that uh, you have to consider, Chris, is, is that at a retail as well as a wholesale level, uh, the Australian market is extremely small compared to North America. So even though we're a, uh, you know, we're largely a gold producing country, but we do have manufacture or, or mine some silver. So um, if we have any surplus, so again, the rumors were that we have 50 to 60 tons of silver uh, ready to ship or, or ready to, 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 uh, to be able to deliver to, uh, for, for um, um, you know, whether it's a, uh, in the thousand ounce bar category or in, in, in one kilo bars that can be melted down by other refiners. Um, plenty of silver to be had if COMEX requires that. Uh, there was some speculation that there's a number of tons of raw silver that could be uh, that could be manufactured if, if again those orders or those phone calls from New York come. Uh, but, but to date, uh, I see no evidence that anything has been shipped uh, from Australia to New York. Um, but, but, but yeah, but, but there's obviously, I mean, we, like I, I, I'm aware of a number of calls that happened in the, in the second six months of 2020, where representatives for bullion banks were calling all sorts of people across Australia and saying, we have a client in New York who requires 30 tons or 40 tons of gold. Uh, what, what do you have available for sale? And uh, certain phone calls are made in Australia, certain phone calls are made uh, into Asia Pacific whether it's Singapore, whether it's Hong Kong, whether it's Japan, and people may say, well, you know, a bank in New York requires X tons of gold or X tons of silver. What do you have available for sale? And uh, obviously, if uh, that can be put together with the right commercial deal, well, then that, that, that deal is closed. But, uh, but when, when one of the um, phone call approaches that I'm aware of, uh, you know, phone calls were made into Asia, and the most we could come up with was about, I don't know, Five to ten tons of gold available at the at the price of the time, and that 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 was enough for for uh, for the representative for the bullion banks to uh, to actually seal that deal. So yeah, so when when New York uh, gets desperate, phone calls happen all over the world and, and say, well, what have you got to sell? And, and and then obviously it's a conversation about price. Yeah, and John, perhaps my mm -hmm. final question for you tonight: How does it all end? Any idea how close we are to the end? Where what happens next? Well, you know what? So, so before I answer that question, Chris, I mean, I just want to tell a story because um, there, there is something. So, so I've got. So you're a trained economist. I'm a trained economist, and so I've got a. I've got a paradox for you and your audience that that I'm hoping someone can solve for me because when it comes to silver. Um, there is plenty of people in Australia who think that, uh, you know, some of the stuff we talk about, comics corruption and all that, can't be true. It's, uh, you know, the system's, you know, the system may be slightly crooked, but not as crooked as, as, as what you and I may suggest. But um, let, let, me, let me present to you a paradox, Chris. So, I'm, I'm, you know, so, so when we look at the money supply, so I'm looking at the Reserve Bank of Australia, our central bank. And, and the broadest definition of money, so we've got like M0, M1, M3, broad money, which is the broadest definition. So from January 1980 to January 2021, so 40, 41 years, the, the, the growth in broad money was 2,968%. Now, there's only one product in Australia, good or service, um, that is below the 1980 price. Chris, can you guess what that is? Tell me. Uh, it's, it's obviously silver. Now, he, he, here is the here is the, the ultimate paradox for the economic profession. So we have a product that is still highly in demand. Um, that that the that the uh, money supply has grown effectively nearly thirty x. Now, um, the only way the price can be lower than than the January nineteen eighty high is if the supply of above ground or the stockpile of above ground silver. Is bigger, it's bigger than 30x relative to 1980. That's the only way that, according to microeconomics, that that's possible. Now, what, I wrote an article a couple of years ago, and what I found was there was a, after the Hunt Brothers episode, the CFTC prepared a report for Congress, 
And in that report, they said that the 1979 amount of above ground silver stockpile for non-communist countries, now communists is obviously USSR and China, and USSR was- Was, was, ahead was of US list. on the communist or non-communist list? Well, the United States at that point was on the non-communist list. Okay, um, okay, but the sure. CFTC said you never, that- You never know but with these sanctions going around these days, who's defined as what. So could we clear Absolutely. that up? Thank you. Absolutely. But at, at that point, the CFTC said that there was about 1.28 billion ounces in above, gro- stock, above ground stockpile for non-communist countries. Now, if you want to add the USSR and China into it and Vietnam, may- maybe you can, I don't know, add, I don't know, maybe like half, half a billion ounces or something like that. I mean, if you want to be generous. Now, the Silver Institute in 2018 published a report and said that in 2018, the above ground stockpile of silver worldwide was about two and a half billion ounces. So in the course of 40 years, roughly, we've had a 30x increase in money supply for a product that's still in demand, and the supply has only grown 2x or 100%. So um, now in, under those conditions, how can the price be lower? Now, um, the way I was taught economics in high school, as well as in university, and I've got a bachelor's degree, I went and did honours, and I've been reading and researching economics for 22 years. Um, uh, the, you know, the, the, these dynamics just don't make sense. Um, and and I, I know you like to quote the big short. I was watching the big short the other day, and, and, and there's a really good scene where Michael, uh, 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 like, a, I think, it's, is it Michael Burry? Yep. Yeah, so he, he was basically looking at the dyna- the underlying dam- dynamics of the housing market and comparing it to the Great Depression, and he's just saying that none of this makes sense. And, and I look at these statistics and I'm thinking, well, microeconomics says that this is impossible. Now, maybe I'm a bad economic student, maybe I've l- read the wrong textbook, but when I say to you, Chris, there's a product in demand, money supplies increase 30x, um, um, uh, the supply of the product is only increased by 2x, and it's the only price in Australia that has a lower price relative to, to 1980. Is there a rational economic explanation for that paradox? Actually, I would say yes. Okay. I'm, I know, I'm you, would, I know you would here. think there is not, but I was up late last night. And I think I figured it out. So, but I'll, I'll continue. Let me know if you would like the answer. Yeah, look, totally. I'd like the answer. See, in the true microeconomic calculation, one of the factors that many economists don't factor in is if Deutsche Bank has, or no, if UBS has smashed it good. Um, I'm almost a little embarrassed. I've been memorized where the transcript about Deutsche Bank explaining how to muscle and blade the silver market. Uh, that was pretty educational too. So those are some factors that your traditional Wall Street uh, business school textbooks, they don't have that variable in the equation, which it turns out in silver, it's a big variable of the pricing equation in my experience. Uh huh. Okay. Well, you know what? Thing is, so, 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 so it's a little trick us get... Americans know over here. <laughs> well, you, you know what? Thing is, look, I'm pretty sure the textbook, the microeconomic textbook I learned in the Australian University was actually an American textbook. So even That's, with that American could be where it went wrong. <laughs> Well, but, but here's the thing. Even the American microeconomic textbook, they, they said nothing about UBS smashing the price. So, um, so, so maybe I got the wrong version of the American textbook. Well, there are a lot going around. So, um... so uh, but, 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 but yeah, but now, now like, I, I, like, I mean, Chris, I, I really want to sort of shock you right now. Now, I had, without sort of, I can't name names, but I had a meeting today with one of the most senior people in the precious metal market in Australia. Uh, I'm talking, you're talking top 10, top 15 in the industry. I had I had the opportunity to, to, to sit down with someone for a coffee today. <laughs> so clearly it's present- not Ben Bernanke. I think we're ruling him out. Is that safe? We're, we we're, we're ruling Ben Bernanke out. But, but here's the thing. So, so I presented this paradox. Now, this person knows who you are. They, they know about your channel. Uh-oh. And they, they know about your book, The Big Short. And because <laughs> I had a copy of your book. Uh, at the Some other guy. 
<laughs> so, no, no, but here's the thing. I presented this paradox to this person and I said, well, um, because I mean, even in the Australian market, some people say John Adams is a conspiracy theorist. He's talking about gold and silver uh, price manipulation, etc. So I sort of said, well, when you have these sort of facts uh, and, and, you know, this person understands economics, I said, well, what's the rational economic explanation? Now, you'd be shocked. And I was shocked when I was uh, with the following answer. So this person basically says, well, who's been in the industry for, for two decades, they basically said, well, all I'm interested in is just selling it. I've never really thought about the price. And I'm just thinking to myself, hang on. Scholar. Yeah, yeah. look, I, I was just going like you're thinking, so you've been in the industry for, for, for two decades. Um, you basically, you know, uh, have, have, you know, lots of clients. Clients are obviously sensitive about price. I've given you a paradox that the, that the economics can't explain. And you've just said to me, I don't think about the price. I never thought about the price. I mean, that 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 is absolutely gobsmacking. Now, uh, one thing that I would advise the audience, whether Australian or overseas, is um, there is something to be said is if you're dealing with a bullion dealership that has LBMA accreditation, you get a very different line compared to if you deal with a bullion dealership that that is that is free. Now, uh, one thing I'll say is. What I've noticed, uh, so as I get more into this and I get to see, well, what's really going on on, a, on an anecdotal level, uh, you know, I work for a retail dealership and we're not a refiner. So we don't need LBMA or COMEX accreditation. But there are some players like you know, uh, Perth Mint, for example, but there are others obviously in the private sector as well that both have LBMA and COMEX accreditation. And I do know that if they start talking your book, Chris, they lose that accreditation. And, and so what I know for sure is, so, you know, you, you're associated with Miles Franklin, I'm associated with As Good As Gold Australia, we're dealing with retail clients. Um, when you start um, dealing with institutional clients and, and an institution like a big bank. They're not into buy... supply and demand in my experience here in Wall Street. That, sure. They don't like that kind of conspiracy theory. Well, no, no, so look, yeah, so, so that, that, I mean, that, that is correct. I don't like that sort of conspiracy theory. But, but, but one of the important things is, is that if you want to cut an, inter, an institutional deal and you don't have LBMA um, or, um, Com yeah, if you don't, have, sorry, if you don't have LBMA accreditation and you're a refiner, that you just don't have, you can't even get into the door. So if a, if, a, if a bank in Hong Kong wants to buy a lot of silver, a lot of gold, and you've got a product to sell and you're a refiner, you have to be LBMA accredited to even start the conversation. And obviously, if you start talking what you're talking about in your book or on your show, you lose that accreditation because of because um, it's a tightly, tightly, uh, tight knit club. And so, so that's some of the dilemma about when you're trying to deal with companies that are refiners and retail dealerships together, as opposed to retail dealerships. So I mean, earlier today, you had uh, Ronan Manley bullion star they're just a retail dealership and because they don't need lbma accreditation they are free to talk openly about the true dynamics of the market same was the same with miles franklin same with as good as gold australia so so there's definitely um different dynamics happening with, with different companies depending on do they just do retail do they do refining do they need lbma accreditation um and and, and the powers that be what will they allow them to say what do they really know um, and, and so, yeah, it, it's taken me a time to get a feel for who's got their finger on the pulse um, and, 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 and who may be sort of trying to miss, like obviously trying to misdirect people. And uh, I, mean, I think you've done a great job with um, exposing uh, Jeff Curry, uh, but also in terms of J Jeff Christensen. Um, you know, like listening to their explanations. I mean, I've been listening to some of your videos about them, and I'm thinking, I'm scratching Transcendent my head. Transcendent economic theory, it's good stuff. Can't well, get you, you, you know, you know what thing is, like, so, so, like, uh, now we, there's, the, there's those two guys, but I, I will ask, and I was just on an interview earlier today on another American channel, and this other channel regularly interviews Rick Rule. So, and then I've said, and Rick Rule has been on the record in the last month saying he doesn't, he believes that there can be short-term manipulation, but there has been no one or two decade long manipulation. He goes that the incentives for the banks to, uh, on a cash flow basis, to be engaged in this activity, it just doesn't exist. So even to Rick Rule, if you're going to have Rick Rule on, Chris, or if Rick Rule's listening to this interview, uh, I've presented a paradox. Uh, if he has a rational explanation as to how the, how does the money supply go up 30x, 
The supply only goes up 2x. The demand is still uh, roughly the same, if not greater. And yet the price is, is lower than the 1980 high. If Rick Raw can come up with an explanation as to how that's not corruption and manipulation, I'm definitely willing to listen to uh, Rick's, uh, you know, what Rick has to say. Well, I hear you. And I mean, you know, I, I won't speak for Rick here. I will say that it is one of those things where it, <laughs> silver, it's it's like it's there, but in the manipulation, but it, it's, it's like one of those things, like when someone has a drinking problem and they stop and say, hey, actually, I'm aware of this. <laughs> silver market is like a drinking problem. You have to be aware of it. Yet when you dig in, uh, it was interesting. An email from someone sends me some interesting stuff and he was reminding me about Paul Volcker saying that he thinks Paul Volcker was a bit more involved than he often gets credit for. But even in his autobiography, shortly before he passed away a year or two ago, I think it was page 61, he talks about coming out of the London gold pool. He actually uses the sentence, we had to suppress the price because after France was buying and there was the drain on the gold. So I get it that everybody's, you know, sitting here reading about silver and gold manipulation all day. And, and some of the things that come out, I understand it because frankly, it's like, it's so wild. Like I understand why people can't believe what they're seeing. I mean, there are even days where I'm like, no, this couldn't be this insane. Uh, although it turns out it is. Um, so John, I appreciate you shedding a little light from the Australian experience. I guess if I have one disappointment as we wrap up here, you said you were going to show us something a couple of minutes ago. I was hoping you were going to teach us how to blade like UBS, which I know actually that's, we don't want the kids out there learning these tricks like the bankers there. So don't blade silver now like UBS. John, uh, thanks for joining me. And can you let folks know how they can stay posted on your research and where they go for some Australian insight on this uh, silver market? Sure. Yeah. So, so, so all of my work is published on my personal website, adamseconomics.com. Uh, people can email me if they want on um, John at Adams Economics. Um, uh, you know, like all my work is also published with um, As Good As Gold Australia. So if people want uh, to uh, try to access their material, we have a YouTube channel. Um, you know, if people want to uh, buy gold or silver, um, people can feel free to contact me and happy to help uh, people. Uh, I mean, we have both domestic and international clients. So if there's anyone around the world that, uh, you know, uh, that are looking for adequate supply, um, you know, we have a very good supply chain and, and we have silver and gold to sell for those who are wishing to buy. Well, I appreciate that. And that is Adam's Economics. John, you have a fan, Jeff Finn, who's a big fan of yours down in Australia. So anyway, I appreciate that. Although one question, John, did you read... I don't want to put words in your mouth, but were you throwing out the conspiracy theory that there's actually a piece of credit paper crappier than the U.S. Treasury? I, I don't want. Are you making the assert? Is that the the Australian tr junk paper? Is it? Are you saying it actually? You would buy U.S. to sell something else? Would you go that far? How how toxic is it? Before we wrap up here. Oh sure, yeah. No, look. In terms of that article you're pointing at, I mean, what I was making the thesis on that point is is that the, the the bond market prices that we've seen in the last two weeks where the the in terms of the yield spiking and the bond auctions failing and um, um, everyone's concerned about coming inflation stagflation um, what what I was making the point on that one is is that because the central so at every crisis point since the GFC central banks have have tried to flood the market with more money printing to to keep the debt bubble intact and so now that we have a new crisis that's emerged in the last fortnight, uh, I think that central banks are going to come to the table with more um, monetary stimulus. And the, and the Reserve Bank of Australia definitely in the last uh, week has, has, has absolutely done that. And um, I'm expecting, and I think even Wall Street is expecting some sort of announcement from Jerome Powell, uh, uh, like in terms of next week when the FOMC meets. So Can't if we wait. do see... If we do see yield curve control next week, I do think that's going to drive physical the demand for physical gold and silver even higher. And I think that given that we've seen enormous stress in the physical market, whether it's retail, wholesale, in terms of London, the London uh, market or ETFs, 
um, with, with with a new announcement of, of yield curve control or additional QE from the, from Jerome Powell, I think that's just going to add even more and more pressure on the silver market. Because I think one of the questions I forgot to answer, Chris, is when is this going to come to an end? I think I think we're going to crack thirty dollars very soon. Um, with all the things you've been documenting over the last month of, of all, all of those elements. And I think if Jerome Powell does announce uh, a yield, yield curve control, I think that could even drive physical demand for silver even higher. And that should be enough to crack the COMEX above 30. So we'll have to see. Well, it'll be fun. And uh, I'm going to be giddy watching if the Australian government can make the Japanese look like some real inflation hawks. You never know in these topsy-turvy markets. So John, thanks again for being here. And Look forward to catching up again soon. Thank you for having me, Chris.